Welcome, everybody, to Radicalize Truth Survives, episode 113. Today, we are going to be talking about treason. We are bringing back our friend, the brilliant investigative journalist Craig Unger, author of American Compromat and many other very important works. Today, we're going to be talking about his latest book, Den of Spies. The title is Den of Spies, Reagan Carter and the Secret History of the Treason that Stole the White House. Have a listen. Craig Unger, we are so thrilled. We're so, so thrilled that you are back with us again today. Uh, we uh, have been waiting to do this interview till the book dropped. And let's just go ahead and jump in. This is going to go so fast. What is the significance of Den of Spies coming out on Jimmy Carter's birthday? Let's well, start there. Well, Jimmy Carter's uh, 100 years old. And I, I think it's uh, long past due for him to get his... Uh, for, for history to be uh, uh, honest to him. Uh, he, he, you know, he went out and lost his reelection campaign in 1980 and was basically characterized as a weak president who allowed the United States to be humiliated. And what I write about in Den of Spies is a, a, a covert operation run by the Republicans uh, that sabotaged the, uh, Carter's attempts to bring home the hostages. And it, they really hijacked um, uh, American foreign policy, and I, I believe it was a treasonous covert operation by the Reagan Bush campaign. And this 30 year effort with all the incredible documents that you had access to actually proves that. And I believe we would be living in a very different America if we could go back in time and change the outcome to that election. And can you speak on what was set in motion? when this occurred to basically uh, steal the re-election from Carter and install Reagan. Right. Well, this was a critical moment in American history. It was sort of a watershed in so many ways. Uh, for one th thing, uh, this was the start of the so-called Reagan revolution. This was the, the birth of American conservatism. And I think it's extremely important in that what, what I show is uh, they got into the office thanks to a, a treasonous, covert operation that sabotaged an American presidential election. And this is in a critical time in terms of American foreign policy. The Shah of Iran, a uh, long and American puppet, has just been overthrown. And when he was in charge, um, America, and in fact, the entire West, had access to Iranian uh, oil reserves at very reasonable prices. So suddenly uh, that all changed and Iran went, also went from being a very close ally and friend of both America and Israel to an enemy uh, and an, uh, as it became an Islamist uh, theocracy. Um, I'm loving the book, uh, Craig, as, as you can imagine. Uh, I've done a lot of, you know, research um, on, on, different ways that people have been interfering with elections. Um, and, you know, this is obviously one of the most important examples. Um, I'm, I was fascinated in the book about the, um, the, the fact that Israel was um, basically a broker between the United States and um, Iran uh, for the for William Casey, who was uh, the, the campaign manager of, of Reagan Bush. Um, and, I, you know, that's obviously a, a very different scenario than it is today, considering on the day that your book came out, Iran was shot 280 missiles at Tel Aviv. Um, so I just wanted to, to get a little uh, a little bit of color and background on, on how Israel factored into this uh, operation. Well, it played a huge role. And, and one thing that's very important is Israel and Iran uh, had been very close allies during the Shah. In fact, there's still a, a pipeline between, oil pipeline between Israel and Iran. But both of them had powerful militaries and uh, almost all their military equipment came from the United States. So when the Iranian revolution happened, suddenly uh, Iran sort of flipped from being a, 
uh, an ally to becoming an adversary, but they were also about to be attacked by Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq, and they needed weapons, and both Israel and the United States didn't want Iraq to win. If Iraq had taken, uh, had, had taken over Iran and all its oil, and suddenly you had the combined oil resources of Iran and Iraq in one hostile country, that would have been uh, terrible for, for the entire West, really, not just Israel and the United States. Um, so, so there were real national interests in both countries in wanting to have Iran armed. Uh, Jimmy Carter, who was president at the time, didn't want to give weapons to a hostile foreign power that had just seized American hostages. And it was seen as being just a horrible, horrible thing to do. But uh, William Casey, who was campaign manager of the Reagan-Bush campaign, uh, and Israel were far more cynical, and they put in motion a secret plan to do this. I, I think when you look at it historically, you can, one reason it was so explosive, I mean, just think of it, Israel did not want it known that it was participating in a covert operation that would sabotage an American presidential election, especially because America is Israel's biggest patron. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to bring up um, the fact that in in this election, um, a few days ago, a reporter asked um, Joe Biden, is Benjamin Netanyahu um, interfering in this election? And he said, I don't know, which is code for absolutely yes. <laughs> and so, so not, you know, there's nothing, nothing new, um, but the, but the enemies and, and allies have changed. It's, it's, uh, I just, it's a fascinating sort of retelling of the same story in many ways. Right. And, and you, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot because I, people think, say, well, this is one, it's October now, there's another election. Will it happen again? That's the obvious question. And with Trump, you have a, a, a candidate who's, uh, uh, very close to Vladimir Putin. He's close to Bibi Netanyahu, and he's close to MBS, who gave two billion dollars to his nephew. I mean, so these are serious relationships, and they're all players on the world stage. So the big question is, will it happen again? And uh, you know, I don't know exactly what will happen, but I will say, does anyone think there'll be an election with no malfeasance? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm just I'm going back through a little history here. And in, in 68, we had Nixon making the deal to extend the Vietnam War. Uh, then we had Reagan and Iran and the hostages. Uh, we had 9-11, which it turns out was the Saudi government. Um, you're naming we had 2016. <laughs> I just, it, this seems like a pattern. Maybe right. um, I don't know. No, this, uh, this is, uh, I, I try to put it in some historical context. And I go back to when Lyndon Johnson was president and signed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 64 and 65. The very next election uh, was Nixon's, and it was known as a Southern strategy. And Basically, if you look at the electoral map, the red and blue map for uh, of almost every election, not, not, there are a couple of anomalies, but almost everyone since 1968, the red states, they sure look alike like the Confederate States of America. And in my view, I mean, that's sort of what happened. I mean, after this, the Voting Rights Act, uh, all the racist uh, right-wing Democrats joined the Republican Party, and uh, that gave birth to what we have today. Um, and, and then you can see that the, uh, in 1968, you had Richard Nixon got a woman named Anna Chenault uh, to intervene with the P Paris peace talks. Lyndon Johnson was trying to end uh, the Vietnam War with peace talks in Paris. And uh, uh, Richard Nixon's gopher got the South Vietnamese to back out at the last minute and made the Democrats look ridiculous. So, and Nixon won in a squeaker. Uh, in 19, 
uh, Nixon, by the way, believed all those conversations he had with LBJ were taped, and he was worried about what documents the Democrats had. So he dispatched uh, a group of burglars, I guess you'd call them, uh, to break into the Brookings Institute and Watergate Hotel, and boom, in 1972, you have Watergate. Uh, in 1980, you have the October Surprise I write about. Um, in 2000, you have the Brooks Brothers riots. Um, in uh, 2016, uh, you have Trump-Russia. So you've had it again and again. And what the Republicans have done is they will stop at nothing. They, they will do covert operations, allying with hostile foreign powers, whether it's Russia or Iran. Um, and uh, they've done it, it's played a role in, ch in changing the outcome of quite a few elections. We just have to like absorb that for just a minute because that is really what this is all about. And Craig, can you tell our audience that this is something that you've been working on for decades? And when you first attempted reporting on this, there was a, a, effectively a cover up. And cover-up seemed to be a pattern as well in all of this. And often it's the same people doing the type of work, um, cover-up work, the William Barrs out there. And can you describe what it was like to be a reporter three decades ago trying to put out this story and all of a sudden having it disappear from uh, the front pages? Right. Well, my book, it, it's not just a, a, trying to uncover this conspiracy. In some ways, it's, it's about the national conversation, about how the news we consume is shaped and what is repressed. And, 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 and it's sort of this is a very dark chapter in American history. And I think, I mean, part of what I'm saying in this book is uh, we don't like to come in, uh, to terms with the dark, dirty parts of our American history. So when I started investigating this in 1991, I did a, a major story for Esquire magazine, about 10,000 words, that um, was, you know, was the first sort of fleshed out narrative of how this took place, uh, uh, of how the Republicans made a secret deal with Iran and delayed the re release of the hostages. Uh, and uh, I was immediately hired by Newsweek magazine. I was led to believe we would be ha leading a, a full bore investigation with, uh, uh, you know, with the substantial resources of Newsweek and its correspondence all over the world. Uh, but when I got there, the experience was almost like a catch and kill operation that, that brought me on board so that I couldn't write it. And Newsweek ended up doing three stories in a row saying the October surprise didn't happen, the October surprise didn't happen, it didn't happen. And I don't know if you know how unusual that, maybe you have to be a reporter, but uh, when things happen, that's news. When things don't happen, that's not news, and you don't keep reporting that it didn't happen. But Newsweek and the New Republic, and suddenly there was a wave of, of journalism characterizing uh, investigative reporters, including me, as uh, uh, conspiracy nuts, sort of the you know tin foil hat wearing conspiracy nuts, and um, the story was just killed. It was dead over and over for many decades. And a colleague of mine named uh, Bob Perry uh, ended up following it at great length on his website. Uh, he investigated for many, many years uh, until his death in 2018. And I went back to it from time to time as well. I went to uh, to Israel where I interviewed people in Israeli intelligence who were communicating with the Republicans during the campaign. And it's very, very odd. If you follow American political campaigns, um, I, I guarantee you, um, uh, you know, Dave Axelrod wasn't meeting with the head of Israeli intelligence all the time. When, you know, that, that's not the way it works. Uh, but Bill Casey was. And over time, I was able to put together that he had a real secret network. He had arms dealers all over the world. He had uh, uh, Israeli uh, agents he talked to. He had, P he had fixers who uh, spoke Farsi and could set up meetings with Iranian officials. And imagine how difficult this is to be running a winning presidential campaign with one hand 
And on the other, you're secretly doing a covert op to get millions of uh, dollars worth of weapons to a hostile foreign power against which there's an embargo. So it's blatantly illegal. And this is, uh, you know, you have to avoid being detected by opposing intelligence and so forth. So we're going to pause there for a second to talk about William Casey so our viewers understand who this man is. And I want to also just pause a moment to pay tribute to the investigative reporters like you and Wayne Barrett and Bob Perry and these people that are just, um, you know, we don't have enough of them at this current moment. But only because of people like you do we have uh, William Casey described as a mix of James Bond and Mr. Magoo, the kind of guy who spit when he talked. That's real reporting. And can you tell us about him? He's a wonderful character because he was sort of all over the place. And um, he was dazzlingly brilliant, but he mumbled when he talked. People, he was, His nickname was Mumbles. Uh, it, it was often said that... Uh, of all the people in the CIA, most people needed a scrambler on their phone, but not Bill Casey. No one could understand him anyway. Um, and, and in fact, people often ask, well, what did Ronald Reagan know about the October surprise? And Reagan's uh, response is typically Reagan-esque. He said, you know, I couldn't understand a, a word Bill Casey said. And I, I, I could ask him to repeat once, I could ask him twice, but you can't ask three times. You just sound rude. So I would just nod. <laughs> and you can imagine Casey going on about some spectacular uh, off-the-books operation he's running. Jim. Um, yeah, I, I've been fascinated by Bill Casey for, for a long time. Um, uh, I just wanted to note that because it's something we've talked about on the show, um, Bill Casey was a, a, one of the founders of the Manhattan Institute. Um, and the Manhattan Institute has been factoring into our current politics in major ways. Uh, there's a guy named Chris Rufo who comes out of there who did Disney groomers, the CRT panic, the DEI panic. Um, and speaking of Reagan, Manhattan Institute also, while Reagan was CIA director, created welfare queens, right? Remember <laughs> welfare queens? Yeah. That, that, that came out of, of Bill Casey's basically psychological operation, uh, you know, um, unit at the Manhattan Institute, and it's still going today. Um, uh, so one, one of, uh, one of the, the functions of, of William Casey was basically psychological warfare to cover up for all of the things that that he was doing. And I was curious, sort of, um, what were some of the tactics that that you're aware of that that he pulled on media uh, to get them to look away? Because when I was 11 years old, and I'll end with this, apologies for the long question. When I was 11 years old, I remember sitting in front of the TV with a split screen with the hostages on one side and Reagan on the other going, what the fuck? It did. It just smelled. It was weird, and like that doesn't make sense. These these things are obviously connected. No, well, well, the the Onion, a satirical magazine, had a book at the end of the century, and they saluted that day with a, a fake headline from the New York Times saying, "Reagan inaugurated urges America not to put two and two together." You know. And uh, and it, it, and and there's something um, that's one of the things that's so intriguing about the whole story. On some level, it seems obvious on its face, and yet when you tried to nail it down, it, it, it was very hard to do so. Uh, but but part of it is that Casey was a truly great spy, and I, I think he would go in a dozen different directions at once. No one knew everything he was doing. Things were very, very compartmentalized. But he would meet secretly in London uh, with a South African arms dealer who was selling arms to Iran. Or he would meet regularly. I, I went to Israel and met with Yahashua Sagi, who was head of Israeli military intelligence. And he said, oh, sure, Casey and I would talk regularly. This is back uh, at the time of the Iranian revolution, and Casey was not in office. He had not even started working for Reagan yet. That didn't start until March 1980. 
Casey was putting together his team long before that. And, and when it was necessary, I mean, so much depended upon who ran, uh, who, who was in charge of Iran. Uh, oil was at stake. The Chase Manhattan Bank had billion, Iran had billions and billions of dollars there. And when you look at the people running it, it was David Rockefeller Jr., but also Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, John McCloy. These were major, major power brokers. Uh, and they could not stand that a peanut farmer from Georgia was screwing up, it was losing Iran for them as they saw it. So they lobbied him very, very powerfully to bring the Shah to the United States. It was a huge mistake. Jimmy Carter knew it, everyone knew it. And the Shah was sick and eventually did die of cancer. But it's not as if he couldn't have gotten uh, good medical care elsewhere. And this was a huge insult to the Iranian people. The Shah was uh, uh, embodied the brutality of, uh, and, and their submissiveness uh, um, and, be, and being an American puppet. Uh, and and so and that's so once the Shah was admitted, that triggered everything, and the hostages were seized in the uh, in the embassy in Iran. Oh my God! You open the book with a brilliant quote from Edward R. Murrow, one of those people who rarely exist anymore. Um, and it says, "The obscure we see eventually; the completely obvious, it seems, takes longer." And I think that we are living that exact thing right now. And one of the things that your book does is it makes the past seem so current. It seems so fresh and relevant. And perhaps it's because so many of the same people are still involved. And can you speak about that? Right. Well, in, in, in many ways, I do see it as a prequel to what we're going through now. I mean, the big, big difference is Trump is he does things in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And when he says uh, in 2016, he said, Russia, if you're listening, send me those emails, you know. So, so I, I mean, some of it or, or Project 25, it's just there, right? Doesn't require an investigative reporter. Casey was doing things that were deeply hidden. And it was sort of extraordinary, but I, I, I think that there has been uh, this. Uh, uh, there, there, there's been a thread of an American history that we really don't like to acknowledge. And coming out of World War II, uh, at first the CIA didn't exist, and it, it wasn't born until I believe 1949. But as soon as it got started, it went gangbusters. And they were staging coup d'etats uh, in Syria, in Iran in 1953 was hugely important and a prelude to everything I'm writing about in this book. Uh, in 1954, they overthrew our Benz in Guatemala. Uh, there was uh, Vietnam and uh, Santa Domingo, uh, the Dominican Republic. So the CIA w and it was not sort of uh, restricted really until the mid 70s when Senator Frank Church and the Church Committee really started investigating and providing real government oversight of the kind we rarely see and that we desperately need. I, I think we got a taste of it with the January 6th Commission and Jamie Raskin, and that was great, but we need more of it. And the CIA was, was really thwarted by them, and then Jimmy Carter came in as president, and uh, when uh, his... Uh, and it, when Stansfield Turner, who was a Naval Academy buddy of Carter's, when Stansfield Turner became head of the CIA, he fired like 800 uh, op operatives. So suddenly you had a lot of angry people at the CIA. Uh, they were really angry about being cut back. Some of them were at loose ends of dying to participate in, uh, in other covert operations. So there was real hostility towards Jimmy Carter that he really didn't confront uh, nearly directly enough, I think. Uh, can wow. I, I, I wanted to ask you about um, Iran Contra and um, this operation because they're they're inextricably linked, right? I mean, 
part of basically Iran Contra is a result of of yeah, this it, operation. It, it, and, yeah. and I wanted to, I wanted to get get you just a, a little bit of of color about that because I think that's a critically important um, connection because Iran Contra subsequently, you know, um, infects all kinds of people. Right. Well, uh, the October surprise was the origin story of the Octo uh, of Iran Contra. It's, I mean, it's really quite simple. The October surprise. I mean, you have William Casey starting an illegal uh, uh, channel of arms shipments to Iran uh, in, in clear violation of embargo. Uh, that's when he's running a presidential campaign. Later, he becomes head of the CIA, and he continues to do it as an off-the-books operation. And especially, it's, uh, you know, the the Iran-Contra scandal, most people thought it started around 1984. Uh, but it, it was the same arms dealers who were do, doing it for the October surprise. Uh, and Israel was facilitating these arms shipments. Israel wanted Iran armed. Uh, so they were very much part of it, but it had to be secret. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you see a thread of scandals going forward. I mean, there, there, there are also mysterious deaths of various people. Uh, Cyrus Hashemi was one of the arms dealers in the uh, uh, in the October surprise, and he died very mysteriously. His brother ins insisted he was mur murdered. Um, but this was uh, there were a lot of aspects to this. High fidelity. You said earlier that uh, when this story first broke, people treated you like a tinfoil hatted conspiracist. <laughs> Uh, at a while, after a while, yes. I mean, uh, you know, there was no way to do a serious investigation without talking to some of the arms dealers. And arms dealers uh, uh, typically don't have the best reputations. I mean, <laughs> these, these are illegal arms dealers, I should say. And the rogue operative, in one case, Ayn ben Menashe, who was a source of mine, was a rogue operative. He'd been part of Israeli intelligence. Uh, and then they sort of cut him loose and said, look, you can do these arms deals, but if you get caught, you're on your own. We have nothing to do with you. And th that's the way it was handled in large part. Um, uh, so, but the point is that, uh, what were they dubious characters? Absolutely. But like any crime, the people who know mo most about crimes are criminals. And uh, they're not always believable, but you should try to hear them out and corroborate or refute. And that's the way I started. And it, it did get me to the point where it was very, very clear there was this secret channel of arms shipments going from Israel to Iran. And it had started with Bill Casey and the October Surprise. Well, well here's my follow-up. Given that the reaction to this story when it initially broke was conspiracy, how are people reacting to your book now? Uh, you know, it's a little early to give a full answer to that, and I, maybe I could let you know in a few weeks. But but The Guardian just did a very nice piece out today that was very respectful. I've been seeing uh, people on Twitter saying that this is the first uh, fully documented proof of the October surprise. Um, I think Bob Perry has to be given considerable credit uh, and that he got a lot of the story, uh, but it was sort of confined to his website. And if there's any goal I have for this book is I would like the story to become accepted as part of American history. I, I you know, it's one of the those um, cliches. I, I wish I found, could find a better one, but that those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And here we have a dark chapter of American history that no one wants to acknowledge. Uh, and I think because we let it go, because we let them get away with it, it has happened again and again and again. And part of what you do as an investigative reporter that you do so well is you force us to look at these dark chapters in your work. You're always there reminding people not to memory hold these things. So I am very, very grateful to you for that. My question for you is we are, I, I am looking at uh, a paragraph where you talk about how how one competes with adversaries who don't play by the rules without bending the rules yourself is a difficult question to answer. 
Uh, but we are right now on the precipice of being destroyed by what you call Republican treachery. What do we do to, to just stop doing what has not worked? Like, <laughs> like platforming, you know, uh, people who platform Nazis on their social media sites as if they are normal candidates. So like, uh, what do we do differently, Craig? You know, I, I don't have all the answers. All I know is I think you have to confront each of these things as it happens in real time. What's unfortunate about my book is coming out 44 years after it happened, after 33 years of working on it. And it's, uh, to document all this stuff is, uh, it, it requires traveling all over the world. It's not very easy. And, you know, as they say, the, uh, a lie, uh, you can be chasing the correction of a lie many years after it's uh, uh, surfaced. Um. Uh, one one question, and I, I know the answer, but I, I'd love for I'd love for our viewers. Um, what did Reagan know, and when did he know it? Because because you it's it, it's fa will be fascinating to look at his speeches, right? What speeches is he giving uh, along the way to um, you know the American people? What story is he telling the American people while? this is going on behind him? Was he fully aware and read into this the entire time? Well, unfortunately, that's not 100% true. And, and, and there have been half a dozen things in which he's referred to it, but but obliquely. Um, he was asked, He was. I think he was on the tarmac of some airport and he uh, was walking to his chopper or his plane and he was asked about it and he said, well, actually we did things the other way. And it wasn't clear exactly what he meant by that. He was ne never followed up. Uh, there was also a, a notation to Nancy Reagan. And uh, I, if you're familiar, it was a, a story that appeared in the New York Times, I think it was in the May of 2023, uh, which uh, uh, was about uh, it was a story by Peter Baker. And it was about John Conley, the former Texas governor and one time Republican candidate. Uh, who had made a trip uh, to the Middle East uh, uh, in the summer and fall of, of uh, 1980 during the October surprise. And according to Lute former Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Ben Barnes, who traveled with Conley on that trip, uh, what Conley was doing, he was meeting with world leaders. And in my book, there's a picture of Conley and Ben Barnes with Anwar Sadat. And he was telling them, you gotta get Iran not to release the hostages. You have to have them hold the hostages past the election. So Ben Barnes came forward with this finally just a, a year ago. Uh, I believe Jimmy Carter had just gone into hospice care and Barnes, Barnes wanted to make sure that he knew about it uh, while Carter was still alive. Um, so, um, you know, there there's suggestions that, that uh, Reagan knew some of it. Uh, there was a memo between uh, of a phone call between uh, John Conley and Nancy Reagan that suggests uh, Reagan was familiar with Conley's trips to the Middle East, but it's hard to get more than that, or at least I haven't been able to go any farther. One of the things that we've learned on this show is that America has a very difficult time dealing with actual treason. And you have in the subtitle of your book, uh, The Secret History of the Treason That Stole the White House. Um, I believe asking a foreign enemy state to hack into your opponent's uh, emails is an act of treason. Why does America have such a difficult time dealing with the traitors that are walking among us at the highest levels in our you know, body politic? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the Democrats need to be fighting Democrats. And I mean, uh, to use a cliche, I mean, they, they typically bring a knife to a gunfight and too often they do that. And, and that's why I say this kind of st stuff has to be confronted uh, in real time. And, uh, you, know, you know, you can see how frustrating it is. I think even uh, when uh, it, our court system moves so slowly that it's just painful to watch. Uh, any of these prosecutions, if they're ever going to get done or not. Uh, so, but I don't have any easy answers. I, I think we need a tougher press corps. 
who, who's willing to, to uh, dig on these and to do it in real time. The Democrats have to speak out in real time uh, and they have to, there has to be real oversight. Yeah, the fighting Democrats is a great slogan. Uh, Jim or Hi-Fi? I just, I wanted to, to um, I, th I think the other problem that we have is uh, a corporatized media um, that um, benefits from, you know, the sort of both sides, you know, are, are the same thing. Um, but I think they also, you know, have served a, a different purpose, which is to, you know, as I think we saw here, um, to cover up for things, to literally prevent the American people from finding this stuff out. Um, and I think the kind of influence of, of some of these intelligence uh, organizations, et cetera, on our media um, is, is, uh, is not understood well enough as something that, that has not only happened in the past, but you know, um, certainly is still happening to some extent today. Um, can you uh, expound a little bit just uh, on your sort of experience with that sort of thing in the past? I know you talked about it in the book. Right. Well, I, well, I do talk about it in the book because I was Newsweek at the time. And, New, and Newsweek, remember, is owned by the Washington, it was owned by the Washington Post, it no longer is. And the Washington Post, you know, this was uh, not that long after Watergate, or at least there was still uh, the glory of Go uh, Watergate was part of that company when I went there. So I had no idea that they would want to shut it down, shut down the story. And I think one of the big factors is uh, what uh, is known as access journalism. And if you're a reporter in Washington, uh, if, regardless of who pays your salary, access to your sources is coin of the realm. And if you have a powerful big name like Henry Kissinger, you're golden. Uh, Kissinger happened to be a, a contributing columnist to Newsweek when I was there. And who do you think the editor in chief took more seriously, me or Henry Kissinger? Um, so, and and when you have Kissinger, but if you want them as an uh, as a source. They're only going to keep feeding you stories if you're delivering for them, if you're carrying water for them. Uh, and I think a lot of reporters kid themselves otherwise, but that's pretty much the way it, it works. Access is coin of the realm. Truth became such a liability for corporate media. I was there during that transition uh, as an investigative reporter in broadcast news. We would always have the A block, the lead. Our stories were what was driving the ratings. And then one day we were relegated down to the C block. And what was the A block? It was the entertainment girl backstage at American Idol. And that's what happened in real time uh, in my lifetime. And I know you expressed the same thing when you when Trump was coming up and the coverage of him, people knew he was a, you know, a money laundering for the Russian mob. You've written multiple books about it. And yet, he and was this, was Reagan, this was the Reagan era, too, or just after it. And there was a lot of glamour associated with that. And I mean, compared to a peanut farmer, hey, you know, this is Hollywood. Uh, uh, so wow. people glamour, I think. Wow. So we've had waves of this. Gentlemen, any final questions? Um, well, just, uh, you know, as always, I thank you for your work and, you know, um, it's incredible, as you said, that, you know, it's taken four and a half decades <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to put together a story that, that honestly an 11 year old kid could see, you know, from my living room. Um, and, and I want to thank you for it and, and sort of beseech our, our, our viewers, um, pay attention to this story, learn, not not only about this event, but some of the other events that have taken place in the past, because there is absolutely no reason to believe that, as you said, that it's not going to happen again. Um, so thanks again for for all your work, Craig, and uh, and for being here. Um, you know, me, it means a lot. Everybody, buy the book, please. Okay. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you for having me. You Beautifully bet. put. Uh, final words, high fidelity. I just want to make sure you send a signed copy to Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Like, hey, hey, <laughs> we, I did that already. Thank what you. What do you? What, what do you? What do you think? You? you know. yeah, I mean, who he was first? <laughs> I, I, uh, I back up everything that Jim just said, and the only thing that I want to add to that is that I look forward to you writing your book, your book, the the book that tells the stories of all of the work that you write and all the work that you've done. You've been so vital to our understanding of the times in which we in which we live. And the funny thing is, this may have been 44 years in the making, but it's right on time in this moment in history. So I thank you. Well, thank you very much.